Good morning. Welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church. I'm Lori Baining, the uh, pastor for Congregational Care, and it is a joy to see all of you here today. If you have not done so already, I invite you to uh, complete, uh, fill out the little red uh, friendship pad, we call it. Uh, what's the other thing I always say? Who's who in the pew? That's right, exactly. Good. I can tell somebody's listening. <laughs> uh, sign your name, please. Pass it down the aisle and then send it back again and take a look at the names of others who are worshiping near you this morning. If it is a name that you don't recognize, please make sure you introduce yourself and uh, welcome that person to worship as well. If you are a first time visitor today, I invite you to stop by outside the map of the world out there in the narthex afterwards. We have a little gift for you, just some information about the church. And uh, uh, we, if you do not have a church home, we certainly would love to see you back again. You're always welcome to be part of the Westminster family. You'll notice in the bulletin this morning, especially our green announcement sheet, there's lots of events happening. Summertime does not mean that life slows down here at Westminster. And so take a look at the different activities, different workshops and uh, many events going on and see which ones might apply to you or perhaps a neighbor, a friend, a coworker, someone who you could invite to one of these activities as well as a way to introduce them to a life, uh, a discipleship life, walking with Jesus Christ. Uh, just a couple to draw your attention to. First of all, this Saturday church cleanup day from about nine to noon, uh, we can use all hands on deck and so bring the equipment needed as it describes here and uh, we'll see you about nine or so on Saturday morning. Also, next week, uh, Sunday, we will have Pete Santucci here. He's a member of the Cascades Presbytery. Uh, is God has led him to uh, plant a church in Bend. And so that process is starting and we are looking forward to hearing from Pete and his call um, as in the life of the church as well. And then just another reminder, Sunday, July 14, we are looking for as many of our church members to be here on that Sunday for a congregational meeting. So we encourage you to rearrange vacation plans if you are able to, and to be here for that important meeting. Announcement in the bulletin is about that as well. Happy Father's Day to all of you who are fathers. I didn't know it was 1972 when Richard Nixon voted it into law for a national holiday. That late, I didn't realize that. Anyhow, it, wasn't, it hasn't been that long ago. Well, even though not all of us here, including myself, we are not, maybe not a father, um, but we have been fathered, for better or for worse, I guess I would say. Some of us have very positive, loving, warm uh, memories and a relationship with our father, and for others, it's more questionable. They were all too human, perhaps. When you think of God as father, you know, what images or what thoughts come to mind for you? You know, do you think, kind of picture a white-haired, grandfatherly, George Nye type of person? <laughs> I always tell George he's got the looks, the voice, everything, you know. <laughs> do you picture God as father as someone who is just eternally patient? Uh, comforting, gentle, approachable, maybe? Or does God as Father for you equal somebody that's out there working, providing for the family, but doesn't really connect with you personally? Doesn't even seem to know you, really? Or maybe Father God is someone that you just talk to in moments of crisis in your life. You know, the times when you're really stuck in a jam and, and desperate. And that's when you turn to God, the Father. Or maybe God as Father just brings up too many memories of too many arguments, too much drinking, too much abuse. 
And so God and Father in the same, sub, in the same sentence, in the same phrase is just uncomfortable. Today we'll be looking at the fatherhood of God and what that means, what scripture tells us about God. Because sometimes our view of God as father gets a bit out of whack because we base it on our experience with our own father or authority figures. It's my prayer that our time together this morning will be a time when each of us maybe goes away with a slightly different, slightly changed perspective on who God as our Father really is. Let us praise and worship God. Let us pray. Holy God, Righteous one and loving father. We come here today offering our whole selves to you as living sacrifices. Open our minds, open our ears, open our hearts to all that you want to say to us today, to all that you want to teach us. And may each of us leave here just a little bit changed because we have been in your presence. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. I invite you to turn to your order of worship that you find printed in your bulletin and stand with me for our call to worship this morning. Let us all join together. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Okay, now let's say it again with an exclamation point afterwards. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. For we know that you, O Lord, are great and that you are above all gods. We praise you, our God. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hymn number 363, To God Be the Glory, is our opening hymn for today.
seated. To God indeed be the glory. And when we recognize God for who God truly is, not who we imagine God to be, we can't help but say, God is God, and we are not. And so we come to God now as an act of worship, as we do every Sunday, confessing our sins, acknowledging to God where we have blown it, looking to God for repentance. Let us pray in unison the prayer of confession that's found printed in your bulletin this morning, followed by a time of silent reflection and confession as well. Almighty God, you love us, but we do not love you fully. You call, but we do not always listen. We often walk away from neighbors in need, wrapped in our own concerns. We often condone evil, hatred, warfare, and greed. God of grace, help us to admit our sin so that as you move towards us in mercy, we may repent, turn to you, and receive forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Friends, the Lord does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Let us live in that forgiveness sharing God's grace with our neighbors, just as God has been gracious to us through Jesus Christ. Amen. As we pray, prepare our hearts for a time of congregational prayer, I invite you to turn to hymn number 89, Swedish, a Swedish hymn, Children of the Heavenly Father.
lovely, lovely words in that hymn. Goodness. As someone who is half Swedish, I always appreciate that hymn. I know we sang it at my father's memorial service, actually, about 25 years ago, actually. So let us come to God, our loving Father, in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Abba, you who graciously forgives, you who love with a steadfast, everlasting love, you who show, shows compassion on us as a father shows compassion on his children. God, we praise you. We bless you with our whole being. We give you praise with all that is within us. God, you are so much bigger than we can even begin to hope or imagine. Our understanding of you is so finite compared to the greatness the majesty, the beauty that is truly you. God, I pray on this day that your word would reveal who you truly are to us. I pray that your Holy Spirit will break down those false ideas of who you are. God, the enemy wants us to see you as a fearful judge only. Our, the enemy wants us to see you as someone who does not care, as one who abandons, as one who punishes. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will work in each of us to show each of us the truth of who you are, God, of who you are to your people as a whole and to each of us personally. God, you are almighty. You are compassionate. You are the defender of our souls. You are the strong tower we run to in times of trouble. You are king of kings. You are lord of lords. You are mighty. You are never ending. You are omnipotent. You are everywhere all the time, all powerful, all righteous, all truthfulness. God, you are our salvation, and we worship you. So God, as your children, we say the words of the prayer that your son taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know, throughout the Bible, we can find several places where God's relationship with God's children, with God's people, is compared to as a relationship between a parent and a child. Back in Exodus 4, when Pharaoh once again 
refuses to let God's people go. God says to Moses, then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so that he may worship me. But Pharaoh, you refuse to let him go. So I will kill your firstborn son. Wow. That is a protective father love for his children. In Hosea, the prophet describes or speaks God's word and God describes how he says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. But then he talks about the people Israel, but the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals and they burned incenses to images. That was Israel's response to this gracious, forgiving, freeing God. And yet God says, it was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, just like a father would teach a little one how to walk. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them, I was like one who lifts a little child to the cheek. And I bent down to feed them. What a beautiful image of God lifting his children to his cheek. And then in Isaiah, the prophet writes to the people who are in exile. They believe for sure that God has forsaken them. They have blown it. This is it. No more. And so Israel says, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. But the God through the prophet says, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. And then, of course, in the New Testament, we have the amazing parable, the, the parable of the lost son, the prodigal son, we call it often. It's about the young man who, as Jesus describes in the parable, asks his father for his share of the inheritance. His father has not yet died, so it's almost like saying to his father that you're, you are as good as dead to me. So the man is given his share, probably one third of the estate, and yet he squanders it all on riotous living, as scripture says. And so when he is totally broke, his friends have left him, he's all alone, he's feeding pigs for a Gentile, family probably. It's a job that no Jew would ever want. That's when the young man's mindset begins to change. He recognizes his sin. He decides to go back to his father and ask for forgiveness. He has the whole thing figured out in his head. He says, okay, these, my father's servants are fed better than I am. I'll go back. I'll ask just to be a servant. I don't need to be his son, treated like his son anymore. I just want to be his servant in my father's household. And so he starts the long journey home. And while he is yet a ways off, I love that phrase, the father sees him and is filled with compassion for his son. He runs to his son, throws his arms around him, and kisses him. The young man hasn't gotten a word out of his mouth yet. The father doesn't know where his heart is at. He just sees his son coming. And so the son begins to apologize and admit that he's done wrong, but the father cuts him off. He's forgiven him already. He calls the servants together, throws a big party for the young man, saying, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. 
God's desire is relationship, restoration, repentance on the part of his children. Our scripture passage today also gives us a glimpse into the true character of God, the true nature of God. I'd like to invite Galen Otto to come up and to read our scripture for us today. The scripture this morning is Psalms 103, and it's on page 939 in your pew Bibles, if you would like to follow in the pew Bible. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, and who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, and he will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. And as for man, his days are like grass and he flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it's gone and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remembers to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you, his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding and who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you, his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What a beautiful, beautiful psalm. Psalm 103 is a hymn of praise that celebrates the goodness of God and God's love for his people. If you notice, it begins with individual thanksgiving in the opening and then expands out in ever-widening circles to the community of God's people, to all of creation, including the angels. 
Bless the Lord, O my soul, it begins, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. The psalmist expresses a total emotional response to God's blessings. This is not just a perfunctory, oh, thank you, God, something that's done out of habit, a ritual that ha happens with almost not even thinking, kind of like sometimes when we pray before a meal, before we climb into bed at night, or even what we do here in worship. This song comes out of the psalmist's soul, his inmost being, his inner parts, as the Hebrew literally means here. The writer of the message says, from head to toe, I will praise you, God. As one writer says, praise for the psalmist is the response of awe for God while reflecting on what the Lord has done for the people of God throughout the history of redemption. And what has God done for God's people? The psalmist, the psalmist wants God's people to never forget that God has shown a grace that forgives. As Eugene Peterson writes this psalm in the message, God forgives your sins, every one of them. God heals your diseases, every one. He redeems you from hell. He saves your life. God is sheer mercy and grace, not easily angered. He is rich in love. God doesn't endlessly nag and scold, nor hold grudges forever. God doesn't treat us as our sins deserve or pay us back in full for our wrongs. As far as the sunrise is from the sunset, God has separated us from our sins. God, uh, friends, a true image of a father God is a forgiving God. In Psalm 103, the psalmist praises God because God shows a steadfast love to those who fear him. The Hebrew word that is translated here as steadfast love is the word chesed, which means a loyal love, a love which as high as the heavens are above the earth. It's not a temporary or temperamental or conditional love. It is a love that assures us of God's constant faithfulness towards his own. Again, as Peterson writes in the message, men and women don't live very long. God's love, though, is ever and always eternally present to those who fear him. Friends, our Father God loves with a loyal, steadfast love. And to complement this love is compassion. The quality by which God as the Heavenly Father empathizes with man's frailty. The Amplified Bible translates Psalm 103, 13 and 14, as a father loves and pities his children, so the Lord loves and pities those who fear him with reverence, worship, and awe. For he knows our frame. He earnestly remembers and imprints on his heart that we are dust. Eugene Peters' take again, as parents feel for their children, God feels for those who fear him. God knows us inside and out, keeps us in mind that we're made of mud. Our Father God is a compassionate God, a grace that forgives, a loyal love, a gracious compassion. These are the characteristics of our Father God. King David leaned on these unchanging qualities of God after he committed with adultery with Bathsheba when he writes in Psalm 51, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. 
The prophet Isaiah urged the people of Israel to seek this gracious forgiveness and love from God as well. When he writes, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his, his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord so that the Lord may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And the prophet Micah reminds God's people of these enduring qualities of their father God when he writes, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. All throughout the Old Testament, we see a God who cannot not love his people. A God who cannot not show compassion. When God's people repent, admit when they've blown it, confess their sin, God cannot not forgive. It is part of who God is. It is, it is the essence of who God is. The characteristic of God's very nature. It is inherent in God's holy name. And so, when we know this about God, this is where our hope comes from. Our hope that lies apart of any, circum any circumstance, any situation we are going through. Our hope lies in the constancy of God's fatherly love and compassion. The writer of Lamentation says, Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I want to encourage each of you to take some time this day or this week to think about the times in your own life that God has shown you his gracious forgiveness, his loyal love, his fatherly compassion. Have you thanked God for his love, for his compassion, for his forgiveness lately? And I'm not talking about those perfunctory thank you God kind of prayers that we often pray, but a thanksgiving that comes out of the depths of your being. I visited a woman in the hospital once. She had been there already three or four days. She was going to be there for several more days. As we talked, she told, us, she told me about her granddaughter that had just called from some place back east, about her own daughter who calls her every day while she was at the hospital. Before I left, we prayed together, and at the end of the prayer, she was in tears not out of sadness for her situation, being there in the hospital, but out of gratitude for all that God had done in her life. I am so blessed, she whispered through her tears. At the same time, I also, I remember visiting once with a man who had received a serious diagnosis and he was struggling over sins that he had committed many, many years earlier. And I reminded him of God's great love and forgiveness and compassion that when we come to God, repenting of our sins, God is quick to forgive. Can you say with the psalmist, praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. 
Also too, just as our Father God has shown compassion to us, we are to show compassion to others. The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. We receive God's compassion, God's gracious forgiveness. We are the recipient of God's loyal love. We are to show that forgiveness, grace, and compassion to others as well. It's like the Dead Sea that has the water flowing in, but there's no outlet, and so it eventually goes stagnant. If we ourselves simply allow ourselves to be recipients of God's love and grace, but we don't show it to others, I believe that's the death knell for our spiritual walk as well. Our Father God, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, calls us to show that same comfort to others. Our Father God provides a role model for those of us who are fathers and for the rest of us as well. So how will you show God's compassion this week to an ex-spouse who doesn't deserve it? To a son or daughter who disappoints? to a neighbor, or maybe even sit someone sitting in the pew near you who irritates you. May each of us seek to show the gracious forgiveness and compassionate love to others that our Father God has shown to us. Let us pray. Holy God, you call us to be holy even as you are holy. Speak to our hearts. Show us where our understanding of, of you is faulty. It's just maybe even screwed up. And God, help us to show the depth of your love, the deepest compassion to those around us as well. Fill us with your grace, with your gracious forgiveness. Fill us with your loyal, steadfast, never-ending love. Give us a compassion a compassion that understands the weakness of others and is still willing to show compassion. We pray this, God, in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. As a way to show our gratitude to God, for all that God, our loving Father, has done for us. We offer our gifts to God during worship. It is an act of worship to share with God. And so I invite Terry and Barbara to come forward at this time and our ushers as well. Okay. 
sun, the waves that dance upon the sea. With every morning light, you place your faith in me. The brilliance of your gentle love will be my strength forever. Let us pray. Lord of our life, we offer these gifts to you. Take them, use them, multiply them, so that the truth of who you are and the good news of the gospel can be shared, yes, within this church family, but also in throughout our community and around the world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, we should be singing Great is Thy Faithfulness as the last hymn today, but we instead are singing number six. This is my Father's world as a final affirmation of who God our Father is. Let us sing all verses.
have come here this morning with a burden on your heart, a concern for yourself or a loved one, one of our Stephen ministers, Bob, is going to be over here and is happy to pray with you. If you have a joy that you would like to share as well, I'm sure that our prayer minister would be happy to pray with you and share in God's joy with you as well. Friends, a benediction from Paul's letter to the church at Colossae, Colossians chapter 3. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. Go in peace. Amen.